or making anything less than A's on all of your writing assignments, then you don't write well enough. And again, there are ways to fix that, taking courses with lots of writing. Thirdly, you need to be able to do logical and analytical reasoning. And there are ways to do that too. History is a good way to get at that. It's an evidence-based discipline, so you have to use evidence to draw conclusions and write about them. Social sciences teach you those skills as well, analyzing data sets, drawing conclusions based on the evidence. Uh, philosophy does that beautifully. Uh, um, philosophy, uh, it's 200 now, 215, elementary logic is offered upstairs. I put all of my pre-law advisees into philosophy 215, which also counts in general education category B2. So that's, that's a bonus. But it does teach you how to recognize fall fallacies, to think logically, to draw conclusions. And logical reasoning is one of the things they test for on the law school admission test, also in the uh, GRE. So those are three skills that you need. We do offer a legal studies minor. I'm not going to tell you, I, I am the advisor for that, but I'm not going to tell you you have to do that in order to go to law school. Uh, most lawyers are liberal arts majors of some type. They're people who like to read, like to write. The number one major for going to law school is history, followed by English, followed by philosophy. And that may surprise people, but again, you develop the skill sets and the thought processes you need. So writing constantly, reading, and you don't have to read law books. You can read novels. You, can, you need to read something with substance, but again, you need to work on your speed, work on being able to get the argument, work on being engrossed in what you're doing and being able to recall it and talk about it or write about it intelligently. Those are the essential skills that you need. So there, there are many paths. The legal studies minor does introduce you to the law as a discipline in all of its different permutations because law cuts across disciplines. There are humanities people like myself who work on law. There are sociologists who work in criminology who work on law. Some of those courses are included in our minor. Uh, we have courses on psychology in the law, economic, law and economics. We have uh, courses in geography and geology that deal with legal issues involving sustainability in the environment. So again, we try to introduce you to the breadth of the field. You don't need to know what you want to do. You know, people come in and say, well, I don't know if I want to be a criminal lawyer or a corporate lawyer. You don't have to know that because that's what you go to law school for. But we're here to teach you how to read, to write, and to think critically. All of those skills will help you get ready for the law school admission test, and I'll let my other colleagues talk about the other stumbling blocks in graduate studies. But the law school admission test is the major thing that keeps people from going to law school. A weak GPA is something you need to overcome, but the average GPA, even for very good law schools, 3435. Three, so there's this myth that you have to have 4 -0. It's better to have a 3, 4, or 3, 5 in a challenging course of study that emphasizes the three elements we've discussed than it is to have a 4 -0 where you took a lot of recognizable, easy courses because faculty members sit on those admission committees and they know what the easy courses are. So you don't want to do that. You want to show that you have a lot of intellectual get up and go. The law school admission test is one of the most difficult standardized tests going and it uh, it measures your ability to do reading comprehension, logical reasoning, and logical games. So again, you can see that taking courses that teach you how to think and to draw conclusions based on evidence, taking a logic course, is going to be invaluable in getting ready for that. You do not need to take an expensive prep course. If you have test anxiety or other issues, those prep courses do help calm you down. But if you test all right, then I would suggest you do a six-month course of study. Uh, order old test from the Law School Admission Council. And I can, uh, if you'd like to write me, I can give you all of this information. We have the registration materials up in the history department. They'll sell you old test, and that's the best way to get, to get ready. I like to have my students do the first test under actual test conditions, just cold. 
and people do badly, and it's an ego-devastating experience. But if you can't handle that, then law school is a bad choice for you to begin with. So <laughs> that's an ego-devastating experience. But uh, I asked them to take a cold and then see what you need to do to dig out of the hole. Are you weak on reading? Are you weak on logic? Do you do okay in both, but you have trouble finishing a section, which actually... Logic is the number one problem I see, but finishing the sections is the number two problem. And you can do great, but if you can't finish the sections, you're not going to get a good score. So it's a diagnostic, and then people work their way through the other nine tests over the course of six months, and we sit down and we analyze their progress, what they need to work on, and get them ready for the big day. So that is the best way to train for that. So give yourself six months, plan to take it once, you can take it over, the scores don't average, the highest score replaces, but you really only get two cracks at it before it starts to raise a flag for law school admission committees. So the average, average raising of, the average score raised is only two points. So try to get it right the first time. And I find statistically that the summer test produces the best numbers, and I don't know if that's because people who are really prepared and motivated take the June test, or if, if it's statistically easier, I don't know, but I like to have my advisees take the test in June. If you have to take it again, then you've got three more months to study until October. December, not a great time to take it. A lot of people do. It's a mistake because when they give it, right smack in the middle of finals. It's on a Saturday, right before finals. It's not your best, no matter how bright you are. So I would advise you not to do that. The February test statistically produces the worst scores, and I'm not sure why that is. It could be because those tend to be late deciders or people who are repeating the test multiple times. Nonetheless, statistically, Year after year, those scores are the worst. So you have four chances. I would urge you to prep up for the June, for the June test. This is not something to be taken lightly. Uh, number one mistake I see is people who take it cold for real, and then they're really surprised they get a bad score. And no matter how many times the admission committee tells you that they average scores, if they see a really bad score, that does impact the way they look at it. Uh, the next point, letters of recommendation. Ask faculty, three faculty members for letters of recommendation. Do so about six months in advance and let the faculty member know when that letter needs to be in. For law schools, uh, letters are sent directly to the Law School Admission Council, which serves as a clearinghouse. They assemble your scores and your file. They get your transcript from your institution, and they send the whole thing to the law schools. Your file will not be considered until you have every single piece of paper in it. I mean, they won't even produce the file and send it. So please give faculty a lot of time, and friendly reminders are good because we're absent-minded and have a lot of things to do. But do be polite about it. I, I've started saying no when people show up and say, I need this in a week, and I have to tell them that I just can't write you a good letter in a week. And the letters do matter because it's faculty talking to faculty. Law school admission committees are not made up of lawyers. They're made up of faculty members and an admissions dean, so who was once a faculty member. So they want to see what faculty members have to say. And to answer another frequent question, what if I work on a political campaign? Should I get a letter from Senator McConnell? The answer is no, or fill in the blank political official. Unless you were his chief of staff or, you know, the, the, head of the, the head of the campaign who managed millions of dollars or something like that, then you don't want to get a political letter because it's meaningless. And in fact, faculty tend to find that insulting. If you insist on getting a letter from doing an internship, get the letter from the person who supervised you, who might, you know, might be a legislative assistant or an office coordinator or something like that. But a political letter does give blatant defense because it looks like you're just trying to use political influence to get in. Uh, finally, personal statements. I'm happy to work with you on personal statements. It's part of my job. Personal statements 
don't have to always be what I, why I want to be a lawyer, but they do need to be an intellectual self-portrait. Something about you that someone cannot glean from anywhere else on your application. Because again, they want to see how you think. And when lawyers submit briefs, you don't get reams of paper to make your argument. You've got to make it quickly and concisely. They want to see how you brief yourself. How do you sell yourself to an admissions committee who's never seen you? Because they're not interview uh, law school does not do interviews. So those are sort of the nuts and bolts of the process. It takes a good solid six months to do all of this. And if you're going to go through the process, try to visit with me during your junior year. And let's plan this process from beginning to end so that you know what you need to do. Finally, if you are in honors, I urge you to do an honors thesis. That's the kind of thing, there are some schools that require everyone at the college to do a thesis. And you're competing with those people. So what you want to be able to show an admissions committee is that you don't just do the bare minimum. You have the intellectual get up and go to do something well beyond what is required of you. And a letter from a thesis advisor who can talk about how you ask questions, conduct research, frame questions, what's your work ethic, that can be the strongest letter in your packet. That can be a letter that's as strong or stronger than somebody who gave you A's in four classes. So please, 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 if you're in honors, take it to the limit. Take advantage of every opportunity that you're given because law schools are judged by how many of you can pass the bar exam on the first try. And it's, it's that simple. It's about a 70-75% first time pass rate. So they don't want to take a risk on someone who's lazy or a slider. They are counting on you to be a go-getter, to go out, set the world on fire, give their law school lots of money, and therefore people who are go-getters, not in extracurricular activities, but academically, are the people that they're going to want to go after. So that's the short spiel, and I'll be happy to answer any questions you have. But please get in touch, and if you want LSAT registration materials, go to room 200, Cherry Hall, straight up the stairs, and they have all of that stuff. New materials will arrive right after spring break. So if you're going to start the process next year, come by after spring break, we'll get you taken care of. So thanks a lot, and I look forward to taking your questions. So uh, just for the folks at the regional campuses. Can they contact you as well? They can. Uh, you can email me, um, Dr. Patricia Mentor, and I'm patricia.mentor at wku.edu. We do have a pre-law advising page up on the Potter College website. It's linked through history. And the site for legal studies minor is there as well. So, thanks. Hey folks, I'm Jerry today. I'm an associate professor in the Department of Sociology and I direct our master's program in criminology and I used to direct the master's program in sociology so I've kind of done both of them. Um, what, what I'd like to do is, is building on some of the stuff Dr. Minter talked about. She was focusing on law school and I'll focus more on social sciences and to a lesser extent maybe history, humanities because we don't have the LSAT, we have the GRE, the graduate record exam, so I'll talk about that in a little bit as part of the admissions process. Um, all of you are here at WKU right now as undergrads and if you're thinking about going into the social sciences or education or, or some <coughs> other discipline um, that has a, a sort of a research orientation the best thing you can do um, to beef up your application to a graduate program is to actually do some research as an undergraduate. Um, just sitting in classes and taking notes um, and taking tests and writing papers doesn't cut it in getting into graduate programs in sociology, criminology, psychology, anthropology, economics, mainly the social sciences. If you want to get into a top graduate program in the United States today, you need to have some research experience. That means working with a faculty member here at WKU who can mentor you in some way. Um, helping the faculty member with his or her own research project or working with you on an honors thesis, your own independent research project. That is the best thing you can do to distinguish yourself in the application process. Because every single applicant will have taken the GRE, every single applicant will have you know, filled out the application and paid the application fee, will have submitted transcripts and a letter of intent. 
as someone who evaluates um, admissions files, I want to know what makes this person unique, what makes this person different, what makes this person special. And as a, we have our gradu own graduate programs in sociology, the sociology MA and the criminology MA, and it goes a long way if you've had some research experience as an undergraduate, because um, getting someone to start a research agenda um, and doesn't have any background in the undergraduate curriculum is really tough. And if you've already had some research experience as an undergraduate, it makes the graduate school experience far more meaningful. Um, so if you're a sophomore or a junior, right now you should be knocking on your favorite professor's door in the department that you're focusing on right now, whether it's psychology or sociology, and asking that professor, what kind of research are you working on right now? What kind of projects are you actively engaged in? Listen to the professor talk and then say, is there any way I can help with one of those projects? Um, is there anything I can do? And you might be given some data entry to do or some library research to help with, but that's research experience and that's something you can talk about in your letter of intent. So that is really, really key. Trying to get a mentor as an undergraduate is important and it gives you something to talk about um, in your letter of intent. For the graduate school application process, in the social sciences, there's obviously the application and the application fee, um, but there's also the GRE, the graduate record exam, and I believe history GRE is required, English, yes. some, so for, for most of us the GRE is, is applicable. Um, it's $160, it is not scheduled on specific dates like the LSAT, you actually go to GRE.org and fill out your application online and you pick a testing center somewhere in the United States, preferably some, one that's close to your home, you pick a date and you go take the test there. The test has three components. There's a verbal section, there's a math section, and there's a writing section. Um, the, the verbal section is things like reading comprehension, um, analogies, um, I'll let them fill in some of the rest. The math section, there's no calculus. It's trigonometry is probably the highest level of math you would need to know. So some algebra, some trigonometry, some geometry. And then the writing section is, is basically evaluating your writing ability. Um, when you put your name on the test, you get 400 points. 200 points for the verbal, 200 points for the, for the math. So you get 400 points, and then the most number of points you can get is 1,600. 800 for the math and 800 for the verbal. The writing section is scored from zero to six. Okay, so you show up, you get 400 points, the best you can do is 1,600. Um, the, I was looking on the GRE's website earlier this week before I, um, in preparing for this presentation, and they're planning a significant change to it starting next fall. Um, so September of 2011, not, this, not right now, but one year from now where they're gonna change the questions around and the structure of it a little bit. I don't know how that's gonna affect the scoring, but they're offering all students who take the GRE next September and October a 50% discount. I guess that's so you could be the guinea pigs <laughs> on, on the new GRE. And your scores would be available in the middle of November. So if you're thinking of applying to grad school, not next September, not next spring, but the spring after, there's probably a pretty good chance you'll be taking the new GRE. If you're planning to go to grad school starting next fall, a year from now, you'll be taking the old GRE, as I talked about it initially. I have no idea what the new GRE looks like, what the questions are like. You can go on GRE.org and look into it. So I'm mentioning that for students who are thinking about grad school um, out in the distance. Um, I, I'll, I'm, just, I'm not going to talk about the letter of intent because I thought Dr. Mentor talked about the letter of intent perfectly, um, and I think you should really be listening to her comments on that. Letters of recommendation, same thing. Get letters of recommendation from faculty who know you best, um, who can write you a good letter. I'm honest with my students. If I can't write them a good letter, I tell them. I tell them flat out. So if, even, even if it's a student, it, even if you gave the example of a, like a week early, if I have a student who says, I want to apply to grad schools, I'll bring you the paperwork and it's not due for six months. If I can't write that student a good letter, I tell them. I, I'll tell them, if I write you a letter, I'm going to tell the admissions committee that I know you. And that's about it. Um, I had you in class, and you got a C, or you got a B, and that's all I'll say. It'll be those two sentences, and if you want me, I will submit that letter for you, but I would recommend you go find someone else. 
Some faculty might not be that honest. So it's really important to find faculty who know you well and can write you a really good letter of recommendation. Um, I'll say something real briefly about graduate programs in sociology and in criminology. Those are the only ones that I can speak to. Um, they vary in terms of their level of prestige pretty dramatically. Um, and typically that prestige level is based on the productivity of the faculty. So uh, some of our big universities in sociology that are the most prestigious are universities like the University of Wisconsin-Madison, Ohio State, um, University of California-Berkeley. Um, these are the big sociology programs who have faculty that are publishing 12, 13, 14 peer-reviewed journal articles a, a year. They're writing books. They're getting the big research grants. So when they pump out graduate students, those graduate students are, are really the top candidates on the job market because they've worked with the best in the discipline. They were on the grants that were brought in. Um, they, they're on many of the publications as co-authors that the faculty generated. So you've got really the top institutions, and as you could probably imagine, getting into those institutions for graduate programs is pretty tough. And then we have lots of universities that are in sort of the middle range, and then you've got universities that don't even offer PhD programs, it's just master's programs like ours. And so our, our program here at WKU, we talk about it as if you want a master's degree and done, you want to be done a terminal master's, ours is a great program. But let's say your undergraduate GPA is a 3.0 or 3.1, not stellar. Um, and let's say your GRE scores are around 900. Again, not fantastic. For G the GRE, you want something over 1,000. In fact, the higher above 1,000, the better. Um, but you could apply to our program. If you had a 3.0 GPA with a 900 GRE score, you'd have a good chance of getting into our program, and you could use it potentially as a stepping stone to get into a PhD program. Um, so even if you don't think your background right now is suitable, based on your GRE scores or um, undergraduate GPA, to get into a PhD program um, where you would get a master's along the way, Look at programs like ours where you can get a master's and potentially use it as a stepping stone. We've have, I've only been here at WKU since 2004, and I advise two students. Um, I supervise their master's thesis in our program, and they're in PhD programs right now and doing very well. Um, so I, I would encourage you to, to, to think about that. The last thing I'll say is getting into grad school now is more competitive than ever. Um, when the economy went in the toilet in 2008, um, everybody ran to graduate school um, to, because the job market was awful. The job market is especially awful. I hate to tell it for, to you guys, but it's especially awful for new college graduates because you don't have any job experience. And so people just ran to graduate school and graduate programs limit the number of people they admit. It's not open enrollment where anybody who applies, they get in. Even, even if the economy goes in the toilet, many graduate programs hold on the number of new students that they admit, nine, 10 a year, and that's it. Um, so the, the, the pool of applicants has increased, it's become more competitive, and because of that, it's become harder to get into many of these graduate programs, even at the middle tier, and even at our tier. We had the most number of applicants we've ever had for our, our two graduate programs this past spring. Um, we've got 75 graduate students in the Masters in Criminology and the Masters in Sociology programs. When I came to WKU in 2004, we had about 15. Um, so if that's any indication of just you know, people running to graduate school, it's credential inflation. You're trying to find ways to differentiate yourselves from other people. Um, so the point I'm trying to make is make the best case possible in your application process because it is highly, highly competitive right now. And I'll shut up and do one, one more thing. Find a professor in your department who can help you in negotiating the application process. My students at the undergraduate level, if they come up to me and say, Dr. Today, I want to apply to these five schools, and I see Ohio State, UCLA, University of Wisconsin-Madison, I'll, I'll, I would tell them, save your application fees and save me the time of writing you a letter. You're not getting into those programs. With your current GPA, I'm flat out honest with them. With their GPA and GRE scores, I will be honest with them and tell them which programs are just completely off limits. If there's a program they want to try and reach for, I would never stop a student from trying to strive and reach for it. But I don't want someone wasting their time. And so I think it's important to find someone who you can trust in your, in your programs right now, someone who you have a good working relationship with and who can be blatantly honest with you 
on what are your chances of getting into certain graduate programs. Um, I'm Jean Sokolowski. I work in the Office of Scholar Development as the International Scholarships Coordinator. Uh, that's my day job. But I'm also a graduate student in English at Indiana University of Bloomington, um, trying to finish up my dissertation. Um, I'm going to be talking about graduate school in English, particularly in literature, because that is my background. And Dr. Fife and Dr. Jones, I hope, will um, chime in when appropriate about rec comp. Um, some of what I'm going to say is also applicable to MFA um, programs in creative writing, um, but mostly uh, literature. Um, first of all, it should be said that the job market in English is incredibly competitive. Um, from last year, or from 2008-2009 to 2009-2010, there was a 21% decrease in the number of jobs offered. Um, so, as Jerry said, it, we're getting increasingly competitive. And so it bears thinking about um, if you want to get into graduate school, what does it look like when you finish and are looking for a job? Um, so I would say three things. First of all, read the Modern Language Association, the MLA report on the job market. Number two, talk to your professors. And number three, think about other job possibilities um, as a plan B um, if you don't happen to get a job um, teaching in English. So thinking about what happens after you get into grad school and finish. Um, but this is a panel on getting into grad school, so I want to focus on that. Um, there was a recent article in the Chronicle of Higher Education about um, why students are going into grad school in the humanities in such large numbers, and some of the reasons that students give that are perhaps not the best reasons or not the most sustainable. Um, Jerry already mentioned one, the economy, that if you're graduating with a BA and you're thinking, boy, I don't want to go on the job market right now, I'm not going to have good luck, I'll just go into grad school. That's perhaps not your best rationale. Um, some students say, I'm, I'm really excited about this discipline. I'm excited about English. I love to read books. That might be enough to complete a BA in English and be very successful, but that's not necessarily enough to um, complete five, six, seven years of a graduate program in English. Um, you may have received um, good grades and praise from your professors, and you're not receiving that kind of praise elsewhere, and so you think, I want to stay in a situation, in an in a environment where I'm going to continue being praised for what I'm doing well. Um, also on the job market, um, people aren't likely to praise you for what you have um, an expertise in. They, they're not bowled over by your expertise in Jane Austen. <laughs> so it's natural to think, um, I'm just going to continue on to grad school. Um, additionally, after having done 16 years of, of education, where people are telling you this is, these are the classes you need to take, you need to get these requirements, you need to do this next, um, the world after graduation is unsettling and ambiguous, and it's sometimes nice to think, I'll just continue along on a path where people will continue to tell me what to do. It's nice and it makes sense. Um, there's something very appealing about that. Um, and so yes, just to reiterate, um, graduate school is not a place to hide from the recession. Um, okay, so how do you know that a graduate program in English is for you? I think you really, you need to do a lot of soul searching. Um, there are some questions that you can ask yourself. First of all, do I have a passion to become an expert on something? I mentioned before, um, a lot of English majors say, I, I love to read. And absolutely, you know, you're going to thrive as an English major um, during your undergraduate career because you, you have a passion for reading books. But when you get to graduate school, um, you'll find that Increasingly, you're having to do uh, reading, critical reading, secondary sources. Are you as excited about reading criticism about literature as you are about reading the literature itself? Um, that's a very important distinction to make. Um, as you're reading critical writing about literature, do you find yourself wanting to argue with whoever was writing that, saying, no, when I read Wuthering Heights, I didn't agree. I had a really different take on this novel. If you find yourself wanting, uh, having a real drive and passion to debate how other people view literature, 
then you might have the profile of a graduate student in English. But if your real interest is, is in diving into the world and reading a book and really finding great pleasure in that, that's essential, but that's certainly not the only thing you do in graduate school. Um, second of all, do I have a passion for teaching? There are other career options for people with a PhD in English, but the most common one is to go on to teaching. And so, do you enjoy teaching? Um, that's something that you find out the first couple years in grad school. Most English um, graduate students end up teaching intro to composition, intro to um, literature, and you'll really get a sense pretty quickly of whether you enjoy engaging with undergraduates, some of whom are apathetic, some of whom are not particularly interested in literature. Um, and if you can find a way to be energized by um, what you can get out of that and what you can give to the students, then you know that's a good sign. If you find that it's terribly discouraging and you feel that it's just taking time away from your um, research, then uh, you might want to think, first of all, do I belong in grad school? Second, is there something else I could do with a PhD in English besides teaching? Um, okay. Uh, there, and let me just mention very briefly some other things that people can do uh, with a background in MA or a PhD in English. Um, teaching at a private high school or a public high school, um, law school, library science, um, grant writing. But I would ask you to think, do I need a PhD to go into those fields? Would a BA be enough? Would an MA be enough? So thinking about those questions. Also, um, and I think some of these are, are uh, applicable to other graduate um, fields of study too. Uh, do I need a lot of positive feedback and constant validation that I'm doing things the right way? Can I take criticism well? Um, oftentimes when we move from undergraduate to graduate work, we find that we used to be a big fish in a small pond, that we were constantly getting approval and positive feedback from professors. When you get to grad school, the people who've been good enough to get in are, are as good, as promising, as smart as you are. So the amount of praise you getting singled out for being special uh, greatly decreases. So if you're constantly uh, the kind of person who really needs external um, reinforcement rather than saying, I know why I'm doing this and I feel good about the work I'm doing, then graduate school might be um, a real shock. Uh, am I capable of managing my own time? You'll have vast amounts of reading to do, research projects, balancing teaching as a graduate student, and you're going to need to manage your time wisely and manage it yourself without um, professors telling you exactly what you need to do when. Um, am I willing to make financial and social sacrifices for grad school? Sometimes that involves moving out of state because the best graduate programs in your specific field are not in Kentucky. Um, sometimes that means you not necessarily living on ramen, um, but really kind of scaling back your expenses because the graduate student stipend is not as much. And also just that, you know, kind of comparing yourself with, with your peers who've graduated and have gotten a job, they're buying furniture for their first apartment and maybe a new car, and you're not because you're still in school. Um, are you, you know, ready to, to deal with that? Uh, have you been told that your ideas are interesting, original, and new? The dissertation for a PhD in English and in other fields is that it's an original contribution to the field. So have your professors been telling you not just that you're a competent reader and writer, that you're able to kind of read a novel or a poem and write something competent about it, but that your ideas are somehow original and new. That's very important. Um, next, is teaching at the college level my only goal or interest? What other careers might I think about? Always something good to just kind of ask yourself. Are there other things that I could be passionate about? Uh, and number eight, am I good at handling stress? Graduate school can be very stressful. Um, how do you handle five, six, seven years of stress? Um, do you have a good network system? Do you have um, a good way yourself of dealing with that? And 
as Jerry mentioned, doing an MA first is sometimes a, a good way to explore if going on for a PhD is good for you. Um, there are some pros and cons. Uh, the pros, sometimes it's easier to get into a better PhD program because you have more for your application packet. It's, it's a little bit more nuanced and refined. Um, you also have a sense of what graduate work is, is like. Your letters of recommendation are able to speak more specifically about your ability to do work at a graduate level. Um, the cons are that if you're applying for a, a PhD program and you already have an MA, the admissions committee is going to be looking at your application in a slightly different way than they're looking at an application from somebody with just a BA. Okay, last week, um, if you weren't here for, for our overview session, I talked very briefly about ways of choosing schools. Um, so just to highlight um, some of those, first of all, there are guides, both online and print versions, like Peterson's or the website PhDs.org. Um, the rankings, U.S. News and World Reports. Professional organizations, for English, that's specifically the Modern Language Association and the ADE, Association of Departments of English. Um, those are professional organizations that give information on graduate programs and graduate schools. And uh, of course your professors, people who have gone to graduate school and have come out on the other side of things. Um, as well as thinking about academics whose work you admire, where did they get their PhDs, and where are they teaching now? So that's a list of ways which you can research and find graduate schools that you think might be good for you to apply to. The general rule of thumb is to apply to between seven and eight schools, um, somewhere in that ballpark. Uh, two of those could be dream, dream schools, schools that you're reaching for. Three or four should be schools where you think you meet all of their requirements um, and you'd have a fairly good chance of getting in, um, but they're very good schools. And then a couple safety schools where you're sure that you meet all of their requirements. Um, once you've kind of made your list of schools that you think you want to apply to, check out the department websites. Um, look for what kind of strengths they have in your subfield. If you're interested in Victorian literature um, versus Shakespeare versus 20th century American literature, how many faculty members do they have in that field and what's, what, what are their strengths all around? Um, what kind of courses have they been offered, offering recently? What kind of funding do they offer? Um, what kind of exam or foreign language requirements do they have and what information do they have about that and information on job placement and how many of their students are, are completing the PhD and in how many years. Okay, so once you've decided on what schools you want to apply to, what are they looking for? GRE scores. The most important is the verbal. If you're going to grad school in English, they're going to want to know how good you are with language. The math score, not so important. Um, some schools also require the GRE subject uh, exam, and your best preparation for that is to read the Norton anthologies, um, both of British and American literature, um, some of the major um, pieces that have been anthologized, and also their introductory essays. Um, some schools require the GRE subject test, some don't. They also require a writing sample. The writing sample should be meticulously proofread. It should be the best example of your critical writing about literature. And if at all possible, if you're applying to a school and you say that you want to study Shakespeare, um, it would be great to have a writing sample that's actually about Shakespeare. That's not always possible, but um, it's something to shoot for. Letters of recommendation, I think Jerry talked about very well, extremely important. Your transcripts um, and your personal statement. The personal statement is not the I love to read <laughs> statement, um, but really talks about what you want to study and why the program is a good fit for you. As somebody with just a BA, you may not have a dissertation topic in mind, and they don't expect you to, but you should have some idea of what area you're most interested in exploring. In general, schools are looking for applicants who understand what it means to make the difference from undergraduate work to graduate work. Uh, they're looking for students who understand what the profession is all about. I would recommend trying to go to conferences, either 
to present if possible, but also just to get a sense of what people talk about at conferences in English. Um, you might also consider doing book reviews and getting them published as a way to start your publication track record. Um, and also applying for seminars or summer workshops. Uh, the English speaking union uh, in Cambridge and Oxford is a summer program that's open to undergraduates. The, the Office of Scholar Development helps with the applications. Um, you can go to England for, uh, I believe it's five weeks over the summer, study English um, history, Shakespeare, etc. Something like that looks great on your, on your personal statement or on your, your application. Um, and finally, thinking about the secondary expertise. Science and literature is a very hot field, so a background, a minor in biology with a major in English sets you apart a little bit and gives you a different direction, a different way to approach the subject matter. Um, secondary language expertise, particularly in non-common second languages, are another way to make yourself um, stand out because that's really what it, it's about. Um, getting into grad school in English is getting more and more competitive. How are you setting yourself apart as a student who has something different to bring to the table? Do we need more people to, to more Shakespeare scholars? People have been writing about Shakespeare for, for a long, long time. How are you going to be able to talk and write about Shakespeare in a way that's different than all the people who have come before you? How can you stand out? Okay, and I'm happy to answer questions. So I have a handout. So, hi, I'm Yvonne Petkus from the art department, and um, for the people in in our um, other locations, it's yvonne.petkus at wku.edu, and you can find that on our website. Um, I'm here to talk about art school and, and, um, and MFA programs specifically uh, for art students. Um, the first thing that I want to talk about a little bit is what you should really major in when you're an undergrad, because we do offer several different degrees, and I know there's somebody here from education as well. Um, we have the BA and the BFA, and I know in a lot of disciplines the BA is the equivalent of the BFA where that enables you to go on to graduate school and that kind of thing. For us, um, the difference between the two are that the BA is, is much shorter, it's uh, what, about uh, 48, 54, 54 um, uh, credits right now. Our BFA is 81, um, so it's a huge difference um, in terms of the amount of experience that you'll have. Um, in your undergrad field and um, what you're able to do afterward. The BA is intended for students who want, generally want to have art and visual art in their life and in their work, but they're pairing it with something else generally. Um, often it's um, with psychology, we've seen that, and they go on to art therapy. Sometimes it's uh, interior design, things like that where you want it to com combine. We also have a new newly minted art history major, which is a nice pairing with that as well. Um, so there are a lot of other directions you can go with the BA. Generally, that doesn't enable you, the BA in visual studies, um, it does not enable you to go on to get your MFA. There are exceptions. There are people who do end up going on to get their MFA, but they're, they're very rare, and it's with so many more people graduating, um, it's just, that's a harder road. We, we have one student who got the BA several years ago, a great student who uh, didn't get in the first time, went on to, and did AmeriCorps, and then she got in at, at Boulder just recently. So sometimes you can make your own you know, way, but the general way is with the BFA. Um, and that is our professional degree. You get a lot of studio time, and you go through the process to create the body of work that you need to get into graduate school. So the handout that you have goes through a lot of different things. Um, I'm going to skip down a little bit. Um, the, the first parts are advice about after you graduate, even if you don't want to go to graduate school, some other options like residencies, workshops, how to keep your practice going, things like that that you can read through. Um, but I'm going to move down to is graduate school the next right step for you. Um, for artists, it's uh, a little bit different. Definitely, as, as uh, Dr. Minter said, uh, for us, money is not an issue. <laughs> you, have to, you have to figure out a way 
to make your life work monetarily. And oftentimes that's pairing other jobs with what you do, and you can read that on the top. Graduate school, in some, to some degree, is similar. Um, a lot of people go to graduate school primarily to be in an intensive environment and push their work as far as possible and push themselves as, a, as an artist in, in their discipline. Um, there are other things that come with that that will maybe give you a job later, including being a college professor. And this is for the person who's interested in education. There is a different, completely different path for teaching on the college level versus teaching on, in the uh, you know, high school, junior high, and, and lower. And if you're going for those, you need to get a degree in, um, in uh, at art education, and that's the route that you want to go. Some people do, do go back and get a master's in art education, and that helps them, but um, it is a very different thing. Um, in graduate school, um, for the MFA, uh, that is considered, at this point, your terminal degree in fine arts. Um, it's true for theater, um, possibly for poetry as well, and that will enable you to teach on the college level. Um, it's considered your terminal degree. That is changing a little bit. Um, it's still the terminal degree and will allow you to do that, but more. there are a few um, PhD programs in visual art, and, and right now there's a national and international discussion about what that should be, what it means, what it enables you to do, but it, right now the MFA is still the terminal degree. So there are chances to teach on the college level, and that can be a job route for, for some people. And just something else I want to point out, um, I have a couple books here. Some of you are familiar with these. The one is The Practical Handbook for the Emerging Artist by Lazari, and it's a great book, and they do update it every couple of years. It talks about all kinds of um, things to help you make that transition as um, going from undergrad into the world as, as an artist, including um, instances of people going through, get, getting their MFA, teaching others who don't, and kind of find other paths. So it's a great book. Um, also, Art and Fear is another one that's really excellent to help you um, in those moments of doubt and help you sustain your practice because art making, no matter what your education, is, you know, it's inherent that there is doubt. There, there, there are, um, but there are ways to keep yourself going. So excellent books. So, um, so is graduate school right for you? A couple of other things to think about, you know, other than the things that I've just talked about in terms of what it might do, um, is are you ready for it? Um, sometimes people get their BFA, or BFA and, they, um, and they have a strong body of work, but they don't really know what they want to say um, and need a few more years to sort of work on your own and get to that point where you have a thesis, a body of work, that really um, is saying something, is contributing um, to your field, but also is a dialogue with other work that's out there. So sometimes that can be a good indication. If you don't quite know what you're talking about, in our program, we do help students by the time they get their BFA, um, we help them have a sustainable process, work on critical thinking, you know, having a line in their work. But still, you may need a few years not having someone over your shoulder to really solidify what you're, what you're doing. Um, so that may be an indication that it's for you, but maybe not quite right away. Um, other things to think about um, are, uh, again, if you want to go into teaching, some schools do offer TA ships that allow you to go on and be a college um, professor um, and get that experience. Um, and also, um, you know, what kind of environment you want to work in after you graduate from undergrad. So thinking about some different things with that. Um, Again, having the, uh, the body of work that you're, you're building, what are you having a dialogue with, but also uh, what community you want to be in. Some people really want experimental kind of communities, so the residencies that I have listed above might be the place to go. Some people haven't yet experienced a self-disciplined kind of environment, so um, uh, kind of making that transition there. Um, 
and that j just to jump down to where what graduate programs offer. Um, again, the most common reason to go is that it's an intensive environment for you to push your work as far as possible. So it's a community of artists, it's a community of professors. You're going to be challenged, as others have talked about, um, and uh, challenged in ways that may kind of take the rug out from under you in your work. So you need to have that kind of thing as well, that, that kind of um, faith in what you're doing. Um, you also are going to be networking. So um, it, are you at that point where you really want to um, sort of be in, in an environment that one thing may lead to another? And that's, that's something that can be very helpful. Um, I write in here that things happen when you're in graduate school. And Christina Arnold is here. Who, she went to UT. I went to the University of Washington. And both places, you go there, you have your ideas, you have your thesis, you come in with what you're doing. And you need to have that, but then things happen. Things happen in terms of where you can go professionally. Things happen that you couldn't foresee in the work, where suddenly um, uh, you're, you're going in a slightly different direction that you never knew before. And I know you guys know this from your studio practice, but in graduate school, it's not like undergrad. It's somewhat similar in format, but there's, there are, um, there's an intensification that happens while you're there. Um, the other thing is that uh, getting a, a graduate degree can make you more attractive to, um, to galleries, to things that you submit to, and that kind of thing. So, um, so you have to kind of make that decision. Um, the other thing I just want to mention is that graduate schools for art are generally two or three years long. Okay, So some people like to go right up after undergrad, and we have a student who uh, did that a couple years ago. She went right through graduate school. Now she's on the teaching market doing adjuncting and kind of going there. She knew right from there. Really? Already? <laughs> um, um, okay. Um, but uh, she went right from there, to, um, and she knew what she wanted to do the whole way. Um, some people need to wait a little bit and make the most of that two or three year period, okay? So realizing that can help you um, make that decision. Most people who go to graduate school are in their late 20s for the, for the MFA. Um, things to look for in a school, um, first of all, um, what kind of school are you looking for? There are art schools, there are universities, um, there are research institutions, as Jerry talked about, that are of a certain level and all over the place. But the thing with visual arts is that you need to go someplace that your work can grow as intensively as possible. So um, if you uh, look at some schools, and, and now we have the web, so you can really look at images of faculty work, student work, all across the board. Um, so if you if you look for those things, you want to look for certain types of things. Number one, um, is the work interesting? Is it varied? Um, does it look like there is a critical thinking going on there? Um, or on the other side, is it all the same? Does it look the same from year to year? Are the faculty uh, work as similar to the student work? And it can tell you different things, OK? In the first instance, that may be a program for someone who comes in, like for instance, in my graduate school, um, I was a painter. Um, uh, I am a painter. Oil painting had a lot of I have a lot of ideas behind it, but I wanted to be in an environment where it wasn't just all people doing exactly what I did. I wanted an environment where um, there would be a, a dynamic dialogue happening. So there were plenty of people in the pr painting program that didn't have anything to do with what I was specifically doing, but they were doing interesting things. So the talk that happened became very um, dynamic. Um, so that's one kind of program. Another kind of program, like Indiana, Uni uh, Indiana University in Bloomington, the painting program, um, is very much teaching one type of work. And you go there for that. So you need to know ahead of time, is that what I want to do? And is that where I'm going to gear my efforts? Um, other ways to make your decision, one of the most beneficial things is to talk to other graduate school students at that school. So kind of um, getting a feel for it. There, are often politics happening in graduate programs. 
Um, and sometimes it's a very negative environment. Oftentimes it's a very positive environment. Talking to several students can help you make that decision. If one student is complaining but the others aren't, that's okay. If there are four students complaining about something, that's usually a red flag. I'm going faster. Um, visit schools if possible um, and really look for a place that is interesting. What they're looking for is somebody interesting to work with. Okay, so if you, um, and again, that goes back to when you're ready to go. Um, you want to make sure that you're saying something. They don't expect you to have everything figured out, you know, in the whole world of your work and, and, the, and the art world. They want somebody who is well on their way toward that or to, toward something interesting in their work. They want someone to add to their community and add to that dialogue of the artistic community. So you want to look for that as well. Um, and you can read some of the other things here. Um, uh, with choosing the work, I'll just end with a couple of things what you should send um, and look for. First of all, this can be a very expensive process because of the fees for applications. It's gotten a little bit less um, expensive for artists because we used to have to send actual slides, which are very expensive, and generally it's between 10 and 30 slides. Per, per application, um, it's gotten much less expensive because it's digital. But you still need to take care with those digital images. They need to be very strong. You need to curate it like it's a show um, so that it reads from piece to piece and shows something about your, your thesis and your work. Um, and um, I've heard that some schools look at only the first four first or the first five first and then look further. So you need to kind of make sure it's very strong. Um, and uh, the other thing is, and this is really important for undergrads to realize because I know sometimes there's some competing information, um, with artwork you need to send the work that um, supports your thesis, the content of your work, the process of your work. Don't send older work that shows that you can, if you're an abstract painter, that you can draw a figure. Unless it's specifically asked for, you want to make sure all of the work makes sense for what you're doing. They're going to assume that you have the skills to do the strongest work possible for what you're doing. Um, so you want to give them exactly what they're asking for, but also do everything to support um, what, you're, um, what you're trying to say. Um, so you can read through. I have advice about the um, statement, and we've actually added a class uh, portfolio a couple years ago that helps students prepare, prepare for this process. Um, and just the last thing is that rejection is a huge part of the artistic process. So um, applying for many schools, you said 7 to 10, generally that's a good idea. Apply broadly so that you can um, give yourself the best chances and keep persistence um, because if you really know this is the right path for you, in, in the art world, it's, it's a group of people judging what they want at that particular time in their grouping of artists, um, but it doesn't mean that you're not worthy. It means that you're not a fit for that place. So giving yourself more chances that way and being persistent, applying again and again throughout the years, okay? So that's it. take part or comfortable in a highly independent process uh, that, at least in the field of history, you can be, it's pretty, uh, there's a lot of alone time uh, in the archives, uh, in the library. Uh, now this is not true in all disciplines, right? There are certainly a, a number of graduate programs where uh, you would be doing research together in a lab. Uh, historians are uh, uh, definitely the solitary type, and so you have to think, am I comfortable with that? Uh, and then I think it's also important to just reflect on your career your career goals. Uh, graduate school is hard. The standard of living while you're in graduate school is not so good. And so if you can if you can meet your career goals without going to graduate school, that might be the the, the better path. And so I think that you know that graduate school is for you when you really don't see yourself doing anything else, being happy uh, doing anything else. So then how do you find, so you decide that you want to go to graduate school, um, how do you find a good school? In history, I would suggest that you talk to your professors. Um, they are going to be in touch with uh, the kind of, what's the reputation, the general reputation of various schools, what's the reputation of individual professors. Uh, 
spend some time looking at that database that I was mentioning. Um, also, go to the websites of individual departments. And I think this is good advice for any field. Uh, who's there? What do they study? Uh, what courses do they offer? Uh, you might think, oh, well, I would be, this person sounds great, but then you realize this person hasn't taught a class on X topic in a really long time. So that might give you a sense that well, maybe that was their past research agenda. So um, once you start to have an idea that I'm interested in these particular programs, start looking for a potential advisor. In most graduate fields, your advisor is, is very much going to shape uh, going to shape your life during graduate school, and to some degree, to some degree your advisor will shape your post-graduation uh, life. Uh, your advisor's going to help you find a job. Your advisor's going to help you get your book published. Uh, your advisor, in a sense, is going to be your, your lifeline. And so you're looking for somebody that has similar intellectual interest. Uh, obviously, you're looking for someone who's giving. So if you email a person and you say, I'm really interested in going to graduate school, this is what I'm interested in, I, I, I'm potentially interested in working with you, and uh, they never write you back. That's uh, not a very good sign about you know, whether that person would be a good advisor, because you want someone who is willing to read your work, who's really willing to give you feedback, um, I knew plenty. I know plenty of historians, you know, who had uh, pretty rough experiences. Uh, you know, advisors not being willing to read their work, and that just makes it harder. And it's hard enough. And so I was very, very fortunate to have uh, the kind of advisor who read my work and uh, who was in kind of constant dialogue with me. And that's what you're looking for. Now, I want to caution you about, say finding one person in each program that you're willing to work with. You might arrive and find out that uh, that person's retiring, or that person may get a job someplace else, and then you're left on your own. So you want to find a program that has strengths beyond that one individual. So let's say you want to study British history. You want there to be uh, a core group of British historians that you would feel comfortable working with. Um, so if something happens, uh, you're not kind of left on your own. So um, I would very much recommend corresponding with faculty members before you apply. Uh, again, you get a sense of are they willing to talk to you? Uh, many faculty members will also say, um, you might talk to my graduate student, so and so. Uh, and from current graduate students, you get a lot of information. I think that is very, very good advice. Um, if all the graduate students are doing is complaining about how awful you know, X, Y, or Z is, um, and it's a huge group of them, it's obviously you know, some folks who complain no matter what, um, it can be a, a, a serious sign to you that for my quality of life, you don't want to go somewhere where everybody's complaining and hating each other and um, hiding each other's books, which uh, I actually have heard of. Um, so I would suggest that you apply to, at minimum, three programs. Uh, I, I've, I've heard of students saying, I only want to go to this school. I'm only applying to this school. And you're not really giving yourself a chance because part of Part of this process is, um, is there a faculty member that feels like you fit with, uh, with them? And um, so it might not be, you know, that it might not be about your grades or your writing sample. It might just be a kind of intellectual connection. And so you're not giving yourself a good chance with just one school. Uh, honestly, I would apply to five but definitely do at least three. It can be a very expensive process, so um, if, you're, if you're thinking, well, I, I can afford to send GRE scores and uh, to pay fees at that many schools, at least apply to three. 
So um, on this handout, there are uh, a number of really good questions. So if you want to just kind of read through that, even if you're not in history, I think that you'll find that uh, a lot of those questions are can be broadly applicable. Um, so I want to skip ahead to this section on the application process. Okay, um, so I have two minutes. Wow, time flies quickly. Um, so you're going to have to include a personal statement, uh, three letters of recommendation, transcripts, your GRE scores. Now, almost all history programs will ask for a writing sample. They want to see that you are engaging with primary uh, research. Um, this is one good reason, another good reason to, to write an undergraduate thesis uh, because that's exactly the kind of work that you're doing in graduate school. Um, but this is something that I would recommend that you really talk to your faculty members with. Um, they've read your work. They may say, well, you know, you should uh, pick a piece from this or that. Um, follow the instructions exactly. Uh, when committees are dealing with a huge stack of applications, an easy way to get rid of an application is to toss any application that doesn't follow instructions. Now, I would also recommend that you create a spreadsheet uh, with your schools, your deadlines, uh, what does each individual school want from you, um, and that way you can kind of look at that you can order them by the deadline so that you have kind of a sense of calendar and process. Now, uh, most history PhD programs have stopped uh, accepting students if they cannot provide them funding. So they will accept a smaller course, uh, a smaller class, and everyone in the program will have funding. That's the, the norm. There are certainly still departments where people compete year to year for funding. Um, that tends to lead to an environment where uh, things are not so friendly, um, right? If, if uh, you're competing for a livelihood with people, that's when you kind of run into things where people hide each other's books and they hide each other's notes and um, things can get kind of vicious. And um, programs where everybody has funding, it, people, like in my grad program, we shared notes on books, we helped each other study for exams, we had writing groups, and again, it's a quality of life issue. That's a much better life situation uh, to have colleagues and friends and support system. <coughs> so, um, there are several different types of funding in history fellowships. That means you have no working requirements, you are just studying, you're doing your work, and they are giving you, they're paying for your tuition, and they are giving you money to live on. Uh, teaching or research assistantships is the other uh, common kind of funding, and that's exactly what it sounds like. You're either helping a professor do research, or you are leading a discussion section, or later on, as you get closer to finishing, teaching your own courses. Now, uh, in general, the first two years you will be taking courses, uh, these are reading courses, and this is very much where you're you're not reading primary documents, you're reading what historians have said about X period. Um, and um, the reading load is, is very heavy. Uh, so one to two books a week per course. Um, so, you know, it, it, it's an adjustment. Uh, and it's uh, a, a serious commitment. And so, um, after that time period, you would take your PhD exams, uh, and generally you take exams in three fields, and it combines a written element and uh, an oral exam, and that varies widely between programs. My PhD exams, I had one eight-hour written exam, two four-hour written exams, and then a two-hour long oral exam. And uh, then the next year, they made it easy. Uh, because they said that wasn't very humane. Um, but uh, it's not actually easy. It's a take home test now, though, so it is a bit more humane. Um, but um, something along those lines. Generally, you're tested over agreed upon reading lists in each of your field. And so, reading lists in a major field could uh, be anywhere from 150 to 200 books 
uh, a minor field, maybe 100 books. Um, and so, again, it's a lot of reading. And as I said before, you're kind of off on your own doing that, right? You can't really, um, it's not very effective to sit and read books in groups. Um, and so, uh, after you take your exams, then you start on your dissertation work. And that is very much kind of a, a process where you're off uh, working on your own. Uh, just a few sort of good and bad things to close on. Uh, Council of Graduate Schools uh, a recent study revealed that less than half of all history doctoral students complete their degrees within 10 years. Uh, so it can take longer than 10 years to complete a history PhD. About one third of the people who start a PhD in history drop out. Um, now, history has one of the longest uh, periods. Uh, that it takes longer to get a history degree than virtually any other degree in um, the academy. And um, the job market is pretty tough for uh, people who want to be college professors in history. Uh, but ending on a, I was told I was a bit of a Debbie Downer last year, so ending on a uh, high note, it is an amazing opportunity. I feel lucky every day that someone gave me money to study what I wanted to study. I spent years doing exactly what I wanted to do, and uh, I was paid to do that. So hopefully you guys will all have that experience. Thank you. Thank you all. And now let's hear some questions from you. Any questions? See, that's what happens when you end on the... Uh, <laughs> 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 it causes people out of considering history problems. <laughs> So to repeat the question, <laughs> if you don't know exactly why you want to go to grad school, how did you find your inspiration? Um, we talked very briefly about this uh, last time around at the overview session about doing gap year or spending time between undergrad and grad school. And that was actually where I found my inspiration. Um, I taught English in Japan for three years. I got a master's of art in teaching um, and did a research thesis. And I kept coming back to the sense that I had done these different things. They were all enjoyable. They all added to my skill set. Um, but I kept going back to literature that I like teaching, but I didn't want to teach English as a second language. I didn't want to teach English at the high school level. I wanted to teach English at the college level. It also helped um, influence my uh, research path. Um, I do Asian American literature. I lived in three different Asian countries, and my kind of secondary interest is about citizenship and national identity. And I thought a lot living outside of the country about national identity. So there was a very clear connection between what I ended up doing in grad school and that intermediary experience. And really, I think um, I was much more competitive and applicant um, seven years after my BA because my personal statement was very directed. It was, yeah, I've had these experiences. They've made me interested in these things. I have these language skills, and this is what I want to do. I had a very different trajectory because I went straight to graduate school. So um, went to graduate school when I was 21. I was shocked to discover that everybody else was so much older because I didn't realize, even though all of the statistics clearly say that the average age is 25 or 26, uh, I was shocked when I walked in a place was full of married people with kids. And it was very, you know, it was very different than undergraduate life. But to get to your question, it was my senior honors thesis that told me what my path was because I discovered I loved research. And I hadn't always loved writing research. I was double history English major, so I read and I wrote all the time. But until I started doing my own research, framing my own questions, and I just couldn't get enough of it. I was absolutely fascinated, and my advisors encouraged me 
to do that, and I went to a program that was, had a dedicated program in legal history where you divided your time between history and law. And I mean, it was the one she, it was the one shot. There were two programs in the country, and I, I got into uh, got into one of them. But it was that process. So if you are in honors, that there's just no substitute for that. That's your proving ground. And if you don't want to do a thesis or a capstone project as appropriate in your discipline, then you just shouldn't even try going to graduate school because that's what it is. I mean, if you don't have the time for a thesis or you don't know if you can sustain something over a year, that's your answer in a nutshell. And both of those really point out that um, really what leads you it ha always comes back to what your curiosity is and what your interests are. So for, for the art field, too, it's even that times a hundred, you know, because you're, you're really there to make work and say something. Where I've seen people go in um, because they, they wanted to look like an artist, they wanted to have that lifestyle or something, and they're the ones that tend not to do anything with it when they leave. You know, they may stay the whole time, but not really go anywhere with it. And I think we all know um, when you have that curiosity. And somebody said, if there's anything else that you want to do, then don't do this, do something else. Because it's not easy and it's, but but most of us who, you know, if you've even had the motivation to come to this today, there's there's a real motivation in you. You know, and there's a curiosity and it may get questioned from time to time, but there's something in you that says, I need to do some sort of research or some sort of artwork or whatever. Um, and, and there's that push from inside. And I think that's really when, in, in our world, in, in our society, it makes no sense to be an artist, but there are people who do that. And it's, if you're one of those, then it's really, you know that you have to keep going. So, And even if you're having doubts right now, you're not sure why you want to go, you know, start looking at what you're interested in. Because it may not be graduate school, it may be the subject that you're, you're interested in, and that may tell you, well... I had a professor who told me, you should go to grad school. I hadn't even thought of it. And it was really someone who pushed me and encouraged me and said, you know, you should go to grad school and you love studying this topic. You know, look for programs where you can do Latin American studies. And um, if it wasn't for Georgia Cavallo at Bridgewater State College, I wouldn't have gone to grad school. And if it wasn't for Lisa Brody at the University of New Mexico, I wouldn't be sitting here. Um, so I think, you know, a lot of folks here have emphasized the individuality of going off into a library and reading. and. The, for me, grad school was awesome. It was it was it was a, an amazingly fun time, and I know that might sound weird, but no, it was, it, it was, I had it was a blast. Alive. Yeah, it was alive. I had a blast, yeah. and it was because of the people, and it was doing research collaboratively with my mentor and other faculty members um, at the undergrad level and the grad school level that you know pushed me and, and made me realize that I want to give this opportunity to students and become a professor and do the same thing. Um, and so it, I, I think for me it wasn't some decision like I am passionate about sociology and I want to go study it. It was you know, a professor pulling me aside and saying, you can do this and you could be good at this, why don't you think about it? Um, so if a professor's told you that, run with it. I actually, I, I worked in the history department uh, as an undergrad and so my whole life was around history professor. I think Virtually every elective I ever took in college was connected to my major, and you know I, I just I, I loved history, and I had originally thought that I would do law. That's why I was majoring in history, and uh, working in the department, I thought these guys are so lucky. <laughs> they get to do the coolest stuff, and uh, that's exactly what I want to do. And um, working in that environment, I got to see uh, the good and bad. What you know, what were the hard things. And, and I think that in a lot of ways I had a much more realistic, I went to, uh, straight into a PhD, uh, MA PhD program, a combined program from uh, undergraduate, but I had a, uh, a much more realistic sense of, of what it was like than, than many of my peers entering graduate school because of that experience, uh, working in the office and uh, knowing a lot of my professors very, very well. Will keep pursuing your interests and honing those and talking to professors to advise you if your enthusiasm wanes and you'll get there. Be persistent. <laughs> Thank you.